Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Democracy and Disinformation with Nina Jankowitz. We're going to begin in just a moment here. I'm noticing people are still coming into the space, and we want to give them a moment to do so. As you enter, please share your name and the grades that you work with if you're an educator in the chat box. We want to get to know you a little bit better. My name is Joya Mukherjee. I work with the Poultry Center. I'm joining you from my apartment in Chicago. Um, I believe a congratulations is in order for educators who have officially submitted their final grades. Congratulations. Um, I know that this was an incredibly challenging year for many of you. Um, and uh, I'm sure that your flexibility and leadership and compassion um, was greatly appreciated by your students and the families that you work with. Um, we want to thank you so much for the work that you do um, throughout the year and that you really um, stepped up and did this this end of the school year and we hope that you have a really wonderful summer you earned it you deserve it um, if you have any exciting ways that you're spending your summer share with us in the chat box we'd love to hear um, how you are going to safely enjoy um, your well-deserved break um, we it looks like um, we are a couple minutes past the hour but um, I don't want to delay the conversation any further. Um, as you're entering, just share your name um, and join us when you're ready. Um, I'm going to start this webinar by welcoming our panel. Um, today, I'm joined by Nina Jankowitz and Esther Peters. I'm going to give them an opportunity to say hello and share a little bit of information about themselves. And if you would share what you were doing this summer um, to enjoy it, um, please do so. Let's start with Nina. Hi everyone, Nina Jankowitz. Uh, I am a disinformation fellow at the Wilson Center. Uh, sometimes do some reporting, which has clearly been supported by the Pulitzer Center. Um, and what I am doing this summer, well, as you'll hear a little bit later, I've got a book coming out three weeks from today. So my attention is very much focused on promoting the book um, and, and doing all sorts of events like this uh, and engaging with people as, as much as I can um, digitally since we can't really see each other in person. Although I do have a cabin in the Shenandoah Mountains uh, uh, reserved for the end of, of July to uh, to let off some steam. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for sharing, Nina. Let's hear from Esther. Hi, I'm Esther Peters. I'm the Associate Director at the Center for uh, East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, uh, more easily said as series. Uh, I will, uh, in addition to trying to uh, move as much of our stuff on uh, as much of our events into the virtual world as possible and on platforms. Uh, just in terms of trying to enjoy myself, I will be doing everything I can to be outside as much as possible uh, and enjoying, uh, at least for those of you in Chicago, you know, uh, we can, as long as we stay moving, uh, we can actually enjoy the lakefront a little bit more. So I am looking forward to being in constant motion by the lake. Uh, and when I get the opportunity, spending some time with family out in uh, the suburbs, so. Great, thank you so much, Esther. Again, my name is Joya Mukherjee. Um, I'm joining you from the Poultry Center. Um, I'm probably going to eat a lot of frozen yogurt. That's how I, I tend to enjoy my summers. Um, but maybe I will see some of you on an outdoor patio somewhere because that also sounds like an exciting way to spend my summer. Um, let's review our agenda for the evening. Um, we are going to start today by reviewing some Zoom features as well as our goals for this particular webinar. And then Esther and I are going to introduce our respective organizations. After our brief intro, we're going to transition straight into Nina's presentation. Um, and then Nina is also going to share some tips for educators who are interested in um, investigating her reporting and disinformation in general. And then we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of our event. Um, we are going to try to answer as many of the submitted questions as possible um, during this portion of the evening. And then finally, we're going to conclude this webinar um, by reviewing some educator resources, uh, PD that's actually coming up next week um, as well. And then when the webinar closes, um, there is going to be a link to a survey. We highly encourage you to fill out that survey. It helps us create programming um, that works for you and that, that feels enriching for you. 
So your microphone and um, video are going to remain off for the duration of this presentation, but you can continue to participate using the chat box in the Q&A box. The chat box is going to be a place for you to share your responses and reflections um, with the community here today. In order for everyone to read your messages, make sure that you select all panelists and attendees in the drop down menu of that chat box. The second way that you can participate is by submitting questions in the Q&A box. Those questions are going to be answered in the Q&A portion of our event, but you don't need to wait until that time to share your questions. You can share them throughout the presentation. Esther and I are going to be collecting them. The other attendees will not see your questions, just the panelists. Let's go over the goals for this particular webinar. We're going to start by exploring the Pulitzer Center's mission, education programs, and educational resources. We'll also explore the University of Chicago Center for Eastern European and Russian Eurasian Studies, mission, programs, and resources. I have to take a deep breath after that one. Um, we're going to explore Nina Jankowitz's reporting on Ukraine. Um, and then finally, we are going to provide tips on how educators and students can explore disinformation and develop media literacy skills in the classroom. And now I'm going to hand it over to Esther, who's going to discuss series. Thank you, Joya. Uh, and thank you to everyone. Uh, it looks like we've got people from all over the place, uh, not just Chicago. I see Brussels, I've seen Arizona, saw Australia. So thank you for joining from all over the world. Uh, and thank you to Nina for uh, taking the time in her busy schedule as she's getting ready to promote her book or sharing some of her work. Uh, I, again, I am the Associate Director at the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. That is quite a mouthful, uh, so feel free to use our acronym series, as you can see on our, our slide. Uh, we are a Title VI National Resource Center at the University of Chicago. So we are funded by the through the Department of Education. Uh, our center strives to be a resource, not just for our campus, but for our extended local communities through a variety of outreach activities. So we sponsor lectures, class visits, performances, seminars, and a variety of other events, including professional development opportunities for educators. Uh, we are continuing to develop a rich and uh, varied virtual outreach program for the coming months. Uh, probably not too much over the summer, but for those of you who are uh, interested, there are a few lectures we have coming up in July through a local uh, public library. Uh, and you know, so please keep in touch if you're interested in that, and, and we hope to come back with a full program in the fall. Uh, in addition to our outreach activities, we also make resources and materials available for both educators and students. Our limited physical resources are currently not available as we are not allowed in our offices, uh, at least with great, uh, with any frequency, but we do continue to host a variety of online resources on our website, uh, both about the region, to learn about the region, but also about uh, educational opportunities, professional development opportunities, jobs, fellowships, etc., both on our campus, in the city, and uh, further afield. Uh, so please take advantage of that uh, if, if that's interesting to you. Additionally, for Illinois public school teachers, we can provide professional development credits for this webinar. We can provide uh, an hour of, uh, uh, for this webinar, uh, and I'll remind you about that at the end of the seminar as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can only provide these official credits for Illinois public school teachers, but uh, if a certificate of participation would be useful for uh, a private school teacher or non-Illinois public school teachers, please reach out at the end of the webinar uh, and we'd be happy to provide you with a certificate of completion. So thank you. I will, I will turn it back over to, to Joya. Great, thank you so much, Esther. Um, I'm gonna quickly um, discuss the Pulitzer Center. Um, the Pulitzer Center was founded in response to a need for stories about global systemic issues to be covered in the news. We support journalists um, covering underreported stories by providing funding for their reporting projects and then bringing those stories to the public, um, which includes uh, classrooms across the country. Um, we support the K-12 setting in four central ways. Um, we have a library of articles um, 
uh, video and photos and videos on underreported issues and stories. We also have hundreds of lesson plans at every instructional level available on our lesson builder, as well as um, student contact um, student contests for educators and students who are interested in engaging in um, the reporting um, on our website. Um, we also facilitate journalist visits. Um, for educators and students who are interested in speaking with journalists about their process and their reporting. Um, and finally, we offer workshops for students and teachers who are interested in diving um, into um, media literacy skills and reporting stories a little bit more deeply. Um, if you're interested in any of those resources, please visit us at pulitzercenter.org slash education. Here are just some of the issues um, that uh, journalists that uh, we work with investigate. If you see an issue that um, you gravitate to or you feel like would resonate with your students, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear what resonates with you guys. Um, it's going to help me um, make sure that we provide prom programming that is exciting for you. One of the journalists that we have had the honor of working with is Nina Jankowitz. Nina is a writer and analyst based in Washington, D.C., specializing in Eastern Europe, technology, and democracy. Her work has been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, BuzzFeed News, Slate, and others. She has been interviewed by CNN's Christian Amanpour and PBS's Judy Woodruff. Jankowitz is a global fellow at the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, where she's writing a book on the response to Russian disinformation in Europe. That's the book that's coming out very shortly. She is an alumni of the alumna of the Fulbright Public Policy Program, under which she advised the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry on strategic communications issues. She received her MA from Georgetown University and her BA from Bryn Mawr College. Jankowitz has lived and worked in Russia and Ukraine and speaks fluent Russian and proficient Polish and Ukrainian. She was a 2017 Foreign Policy Interrupted Fellow. Let's welcome again Nina Jankowitz. And I am going to swap out my screen for hers. Don't forget to un yeah. yourself. I think, am I unmuted now? There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, it's hard to sometimes find the window that you want to present. All right. Um, thank you everyone for being here. It's really an honor to be with you all tonight and across so many time zones. I'm really impressed. Folks from the Philippines, Australia, and uh, seemingly every time zone in the Uni United States. Um, as I said, really happy to be here with you and very, very grateful to the Pulitzer Center um, for pro providing me not only this opportunity, but the opportunity to have done this project last year. Uh, we didn't know when I went out, of course, to Ukraine in March of 2019 that, uh, you know, it was going to become such a critical country for the United States and, and the course of our politics last year. Um, but I am certainly glad that I was able to, uh, to be there to witness the historic election that went on. Um, and also to, uh, to be able to provide some insight to not only Americans, but um, many people around the world about what's going on in Ukraine when there's often a lot of disinformation about it. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, this is a picture from uh, a rally that I went to from one of the presidential candidates, and it, I think it just gives you a really good sense of, uh, of Ukrainian life. Um, so often people ask me how I got involved with um, with Eastern Europe, but also with disinformation. It's a weird thing to study, uh, although of course it affects all of our lives now. Um, and I think it's it, um, useful to understand where I'm coming from with, with this when I speak about it. So um, as you probably noticed from my last name, my family is, is Polish, but also Ukrainian um, on, on both sides. And so this, uh, this family background really got me interested in the region when I was a young kid. Um, on the left, you see a picture of me next to a sign of a town called Vysotsko. Um, it's in uh, Western Ukraine. And my grandfather was actually born in that town. Uh, he is, was ethnically Polish. Um, the town used to be in Poland during the interwar period. And he and his family were deported uh, during World War II. And those stories were really what 
got me interested in the region, um, his immigration story, his status as a refugee during World War II. Um, and it's something that I have always uh, really held very closely to my heart. And it, it kind of affects my experience as an American as well, because um, not as many people have such um, strong ties, particularly from like European countries to, uh, to their immigration story. And I think that really affected uh, me and my development um, as a kid and, and uh, interests certainly as an adult and an academic. Um, and my first job out of graduate school, I went to a program uh, that's very similar to, to Ceres at UChicago. I went to Ceres at, at Georgetown University, um, was with the National Democratic Institute, which is a democracy support organization um, that supports activists and uh, political groups and election monitors all around the world um, in their search and support for democracy. And uh, my interests in, in that sort of work in human rights and in making sure everyone's voices are heard um, in the democratic process and at, at the ballot box certainly affects my views of disinformation. And on the right is a picture of me uh, monitoring an election with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, this was in Russia's 2018 election. As you can see, it's quite cold. <laughs> um, and uh, I also was lucky enough, as Joya mentioned in uh, her introduction, to serve as a Fulbright Foreign uh, Public Policy Fellow in Ukraine in 2016 and 2017. During that time, I was advising the uh, Ukrainian Foreign Ministry and the spokesperson there on strategic communications and how to counter disinformation. And on the left, you see in the gray coat, uh, that was the woman I worked very closely with, the spokesperson of the foreign ministry, Mariana Betza. Um, and she's now the ambassador to Estonia. Um, and then since I came back from that uh, stint in Ukraine, I have been doing a lot of research and reporting and writing, mostly from my seat at the Wilson Center, which is a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit research institution in Washington, also known as a think tank, uh, where I've been lucky enough to look at disinformation from this lens of uh, Central and Eastern European studies, but also uh, democracy. And that's kind of um, what really shapes my work and drives me because I feel like disinformation is not a threat that is a political threat or a partisan threat. It's a threat that affects people's participation and their voices being heard in the democratic process. And that's why it's so critical that we address it today and raise awareness about it, which is why I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, I, I think it's important at the beginning of all of these discussions to define terms because uh, Often in the media, and I say this as a part-time member of the media, uh, there, there are a lot of different terms that people use to mean different things in the disinformation space. And I think um, it's important to just set out what is and is not uh, disinformation. So disinformation is the false or misleading information that is spread with malign intent. So uh, that is somebody who, who intends to deceive us. Misinformation is false or misleading information that is spread without that malign intent. So I always give the example of, you know, your aunt or uncle sharing uh, a silly chain email or um, something about a Nigerian prince who wants to, uh, you want, wants him to wire you money and things like that. Um, that's misinformation. It doesn't have that malign intent behind it. And propaganda is something entirely different. That is information spread uh, to persuade an audience, usually with a political connotation or on behalf of a government. So this is an important distinction because sometimes we hear disinformation and propaganda shared interchangeably and they're not the the same thing. Um, the Soviet Union often used propaganda to spread its message, its pro-communist, pro-Soviet message. Uh, what Russia Today is doing, and I don't mean Russia Today, the network, although they are, they are often doing the same thing, what Russia is doing today um, is, is not necessarily pro-Russia. It's going to increase Russia's status in the world, but it can often be um, using two different uh, sides of a political issue in order to inspire chaos. Um, so we've seen, for instance, in the American context, Russia supporting politicians and movements both on the left and the right. Um, and this is a really important distinction between disinformation and propaganda. 
And I also thought it would be important to just give you a little bit of background about Ukraine, uh, because everybody has a, a bit of a different conception about what Ukraine is. Um, I'm going to start in the middle of, of the bullet points and just say, uh, I hope that everyone after the impeachment hearings knows that it is not the Ukraine, it is just Ukraine, uh, and that we spell the capital K-Y-I-V, Kiev, not Kiev. Um, both of these linguistic differences are kind of relics from the Soviet period, and Ukraine has been independent since 1991, and especially since Russia has uh, invaded and annexed parts of Ukraine, Ukrainians um, are really trying to claim their own narrative. Um, and I think it's really important that we refer to them as they want to be referred to. So that's the first thing I'll say. Um, the second misconception I always run into with Ukraine, and we saw this uh, during a lot of the impeachment coverage, was people refer to it as a small post-Soviet nation or a small Eastern European nation. Ukraine is huge. If you look on a map, it's quite large. Uh, it has 40 million people. It takes a very long time to get across it from, from any way that you, you go. It takes many hours in a train or bumping along uh, some country roads. It is a large country. It has a lot of agricultural and uh, industrial prowess. Um, and unfortunately, in its post-Soviet development, uh, has been beleaguered by corruption, um, which has stunted its growth and its integration with the uh, European community. Um, there are some, some important things in its history, um, unfortunately some very sad things during the Soviet period. Uh, a man-made famine affected millions and millions of people. It's called the Holodomor. If you want to read a book on that, I would suggest Anne Applebaum's Red Famine. Um, but this was a man-made famine where a lot of the food in Ukraine was sent to other capitals around the Soviet Union and starved millions of people. Um, of course, it was the site of many bloody battles during World War II. Another great book on that is Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder. Um, and now, thanks to HBO, everyone knows the details of what happened during the Chernobyl disaster. Again, there's another spelling difference there if you're using Russian or Ukrainian spelling. Uh, so I tried to, to reflect both because we often think of it as Chernobyl. But it also has a rich and, and vibrant cultural history. Russian Orthodoxy was born in Kiev. Um, there are a lot of right from Ukraine, Gogol, Shevchenko, Bulgakov, who wrote The Master and Margarita. Um, so it's a really rich and vibrant place. And if we ever get to travel again, I would encourage everyone to go there. Um, and of course, there's the political context that brings us to where we are today. So um, why has Ukraine become the center of kind of a, a clash of civilizations, as some have called it? Why has Russia used Ukraine as a laboratory for its disinformation? Um, in 2014 and, and beginning in late 2013, uh, the former regime of Viktor Yanukovych, who used to be the president of Ukraine, was about to sign an association agreement with the European Union. Uh, and many, many Ukrainian citizens had, had hoped for this and waited for this for a long time. It had been something they were working towards since 1991. And at the last minute, he reneged on that deal to pursue closer cooperation with Putin and with Russia. Uh, and this brought about what we know as the Euromaidan revolution or the revolution of dignity. The Maidan is the main square in Kiev where many people gathered for months on end, uh, even under sniper fire, to show that they wanted to be a part of Europe and they wanted dignity in their lives. They didn't want uh, the corruption that they had been subject to for so many years. Uh, Yanukovych eventually fled Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine had a democratic election in 2014, but unfortunately, Russia wanted to keep Ukraine in its orbit, um, again, for those agricultural and industrial reasons, but also because um, it was, you know, it's, it's great for Russia to have a large country like Ukraine under its wing uh, as a buffer to Europe um, for a variety of reasons, both economic and military, as well as socio-political. Uh, so Russia decided to annex the Crimean Peninsula illegally uh, and began a war in the Donbass region, the eastern region of Ukraine, that has killed 13,000 people. And this, of course, was coupled with uh, a, a disinformation offensive. Many of the tactics that we saw happen in 2016 in the United States were tested out in Ukraine, uh, and that was done with the help of the Internet Research Agency. 
Um, and again, the goals that Russia has uh, in Ukraine after the Maidan are to undermine the legitimacy of this government that's come into, into being. Uh, now we're in the second administration. Everyone's familiar with Zelensky. I'll talk a little bit about Poroshenko and Zelensky in a few minutes. Um, but they've had two uh, successful democratic transitions of power, uh, two parliamentary elections, very clean. This is a huge deal for Ukraine and, and Russia wants to do everything that it can do uh, to undermine the legitimacy of that government and often calls um, what happened a coup, et cetera, et cetera. It also wants to weaken Ukraine's support in the transatlantic community. Um, so Ukraine is on a, a somewhat circuitous path toward uh, integration with the EU and NATO, and Russia wants to make sure that that doesn't happen and is trying to poke as much as it can um, to, uh, to ensure that Ukraine fatigue continues to happen, that Ukraine gets less money and less support in the transatlantic community. And that is one of its goals. So it's not just focused on disinformation in Ukraine, but in the, toward the supporters of Ukraine. And ultimately, this will help Russia and the Kremlin achieve greater influence over Kiev and hopefully um, other countries in the post-Soviet space that are thinking about um, you know, closer integration with the uh, transatlantic community. Um, so, as I mentioned before, a lot of the tactics that were used in 2016 were first used in Ukraine. It has been a disinformation and I would also say cyber attack laboratory for many, many years. Um, this is during Maidan, uh, the Internet Research Agency, according to reporting by the Washington Post, um, was testing out many of its tactics of using what the social media platforms call inauthentic amplifiers, aka fake accounts, um, in order to cast doubt on events on the ground during uh, the Maidan revolution. And so this is a quote from uh, one man who said that he lived in Kiev and that uh, the peaceful protests ended. They've been uh, d displaced by armed nationalists. There are fascists. Um, a lot of the Russian propaganda and disinformation about Ukraine says that Ukraine is full of fascists, even though they're, they have, I think, less than 1% uh, of, of the votes in recent elections. So uh, purely disinformation, but again, trying to undermine that sovereignty, undermine um, the triumph of Maidan, and undermine the credibility that the protesters had. Um, we also saw similar things when Russia was in the midst of annexing Crimea. Um, and this is a, a difficult um, scenario for reporters to navigate. And we had to do a lot of the similar things during uh, the U.S. election, unfortunately. You know, journalists are trained to try to tell all sides of the story, um, to talk to people on both sides of an issue. So when uh, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and held this illegal referendum um, that in which, you know, uh, Crimean citizens were able to declare themselves part of Russia. Um, there was kind of this both sidesism going on in some of the co coverage, and you see some of it here. Um, these people who we, we don't know if they are actual Crimean citizens or if they were, um, you know, sent by Russia. Russia had these... Uh, armed militants it sent that had no insignia on their uniforms, um, but were there to quote unquote protect the peace. They were called polite people or little green men. Um, and they were featured in the coverage without really um, any skepticism. Uh, and the, the referendum that happened um, that you know claimed that Crimea was part of Russia uh, was basically held at gunpoint. You know, Crimea had been militarily seized by the Russian Federation, um, and yet we were taking quotes from people publicly, and I say we journalists collectively, were taking quotes, quotes from people publicly on the street who were quite scared and um, essentially operating in a situation where, uh, you know, they, they were not free to express their opinions. Um, and so it begs the question of how do you cover disinformation, especially when one side has no intention of telling the truth. Um, I think this is something that we're seeing uh, the media struggling with and have been seeing the media struggle with over the past four years. And then uh, election 2019 came around um, and this was going to be a huge moment for Ukraine. Uh, President Poroshenko was seeking a second term um, to kind of uh, continue the success that he had wrought in Ukraine, um, further Euro-Atlantic integration, um, a fight against corruption, et cetera, et cetera. But it was also an opportunity for actors like Russia 
and um, domestic actors within Ukraine to spread disinformation. And this is a picture I took um, from close to the end of the election period in April 2019, when President Poroshenko and then candidate Zelensky had a big debate in a soccer stadium uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev, that thousands of people, as you can see, attended. Um, it was a really interesting moment that I feel like encapsulated the campaign, which had two very famous people, I'll talk about them in a minute, um, was very theatrical, involved a lot of mudslinging, um, but really uh, that mudslinging meant that the Kremlin and other bad actors did not have to do uh, the amount of, of dirty work that they necessarily are, were used to doing because Ukrainians were doing it themselves. And again, this might sound familiar to many of us in the United States right now. Um, Ukrainians kind of left themselves vulnerable uh, and polarized in this environment. Um, and you can kind of see that in the picture here. So President Poroshenko, uh, he is known as the Chocolate King in, in Ukraine. Uh, he owns a firm called Roshan, which is basically the Ukrainian Hershey's, um, and was quite a rich man, an oligarch uh, who had been in parliament before, spoke good English, and he was a kind of a natural choice for, to lead Ukraine um, as Ukraine went into this new democratic period. And in 2019, he was seeking a second term. Um, and he kind of categorized the election as a choice for the country, a simple choice, if you wanted to keep Ukraine on this pro-European, anti-Russian path. Um, and to the right, you see a cemetery in the city of Ivano-Frankivsk, which is in Ukraine's west, West, a traditional stronghold for uh, pro-Ukrainian sentiment, anti-Russian sentiment. And this cemetery is filled with people who were killed in the war in the Donbass, which, as I mentioned before, has killed over 13,000 people um, at this point. And what I think was interesting and what drove me to snap this picture when I was walking around there doing some reporting is that in uh, just, just right of center, you can see that right, the red sign, um, it says Dumai which in Ukrainian means think. Um, and this was President Poroshenko's election campaign. Think about the choice that you are making. Um, this was during the first round, and I'll show you a little bit what his, his second round uh, posters looked like in a bit. Um, and he was running, the main challenger was Volodymyr Zelensky, who uh, was a comedian, a showman, successful businessman, uh, who came from a Russian-speaking, ethnically Russian, uh, Jewish family in Kribirich, which was an, an industrial city, quite a rundown city, um, south of Kiev. Uh, but a very famous man who happened to play the president in a popular sitcom uh, called Servant of the People. And at first, no one particularly took his candidacy seriously, but he offered this message not only of, uh, of renewal. He said, you know, uh, politicians aren't working for us in Ukraine. They are corrupt. We need somebody new here. But he offered a message of, of hope and of a united Ukraine. Um, he said it doesn't matter if you speak Russian, if you speak Ukrainian, uh, what you, your political tendencies are. We're creating a party for everyone. Uh, and we're going to create a Ukraine for everyone as well. And that really resonated with a lot of people. Um, but it was still a very dirty campaign. Uh, as I mentioned before, domestically in particular, there was a lot of disinformation being thrown about. Um, in Ukraine, they call that black PR, chorny PR, they call it PR. Um, and to the left, you'll see a, a, a sticker. Many of these were stuck around, uh, especially the capital, Kiev before the election, um, one of the main narratives about uh, Zelensky was that he, um, he was a drug user. So you see him with cocaine under his nostrils, but also for good measure, some sort of Hitler mustache because they uh, claimed that he was, going, he was a fascist and he was going to sell uh, Ukraine back to Russia, essentially. Um, and then on the far right, you see uh, just before the second round of the election, another Poroshenko ad, uh, it says, which means uh, the most important thing above all else is not to sacrifice the country. Um, so he viewed, uh, you know, essentially Zelensky's campaign as a sacrifice of Ukraine, that the, the entire country would be, uh, would be lost if, if Zelensky were to win. Um, on the other hand, Zelensky had his very uniting message still, which was the end of the era of lies, the end of the era of corruption. Um, and this is a, a snap from um, his hometown in Kribirich. 
So what, what were the parallels then of, of the disinformation that did happen? Um, there were a lot between uh, not only, you know, what we saw um, bad actors like Russia doing, but again, the domestic disinformation uh, market, which I think we're seeing growing all over the world right now, particularly as coronavirus and dis and misinformation about coronavirus is spreading. Um, the most important thing to understand about disinformation, whether it's in Ukraine, any of the other countries I study or here in the United States is that it's not just about fake news. It's not things that people are making up out of nowhere. It exploits divisions in society and it exploits our emotion. And in Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of tension over language and ethnicity in particular. Um, and so there was uh, disinformation about what Zelensky, for instance, would um, say and do to Ukrainian speakers. Uh, there is sometimes disinformation that Russia uses about what Ukraine intends to do to Russian speakers. In fact, just this week uh, in Ukraine, there has been a, an uproar. I wouldn't call this disinformation, although it has been provoked by certain uh, members of, of the political class who are very angry that McDonald's has decided to not include Russian language on its ordering kiosks in Ukraine. Um, and they are saying that this is against uh, Russian speakers' rights. So these are some of the main issues, also corruption and fascism, um, that uh, bad actors have been exploiting in, in Ukrainian society. Here in the United States, it might be things like racism. Uh, it might be our political polarization or uh, regional differences, uh, certainly economic divides, um, are all issues that we've seen bad actors exploit. Um, and another important thing is that in Ukraine, uh, as you saw from the media circus that was the debate in the soccer stadium, um, the media were feeding into and amplifying disinformation in many cases. Ukraine has a very fragmented and polarized um, media sector. If you can imagine something about 10 times more polarized than the US media, that's what Ukraine's media looks like. It is owned by oligarchs and something that made uh, the Ukrainian election even more interesting was that Poroshenko has his own TV channel and Zelensky, while he doesn't own his own TV channel, is close to an oligarch who broadcasts Zelensky's programs. So they each essentially had a de facto mouthpiece through which they would uh, broadcast certain messages about themselves. And most of the time, Zelensky's messages were, were pretty above board. There were a few things that his supporters planted that were definitely disinformation, but I would say his campaign stuck to pretty clean tactics. Unfortunately, Poroshenko uh, did not do that um, and spread, as I mentioned before, the, the drug user uh, issues and, and things like that. We also found out late in the campaign that um, a PR firm related to Poroshenko had kind of got around Facebook's ad rules in Ukraine um, in order to spread disinformation about, uh, about Zelensky. Um, and again, uh, this, this just leaves Ukraine more vulnerable when um, certain politicians are exacerbating their own tensions in society for political gain. And we're seeing that, um, again, happening in the United States right now as well. Um, Something that I think is a really important trend that I've been trying to sound the alarm bell about, not only since I've been in, to Ukraine, but, uh, but for years before that as well, is that the bad actors in the disinformation space, again, whether they are foreign or domestic, are adapting to this new environment. They're adapting to people knowing a little bit more about how disinformation works, being a bit savvier about it, and they're adapting to the new rules that platforms are putting into place, making it harder for them to manipulate. And so they're using underground vectors where there's a little bit less oversight over the things that they're doing. They're using things like groups on Facebook that are secret or private to seed and spread narratives. In Ukraine, they were using encrypted messengers. And we've seen this in other countries like Brazil and India. Um, in Ukraine, Telegram is quite popular and there are Telegram channels for every town. So you might have a town uh, Telegram like Beautiful Kharkiv and people will post things about things to do, but then there will also be some disinformation narratives and anyone can post to it. It's like a giant message board and it's, it's really hard to monitor that. Um, and then something really interesting that happened ahead of the election was we saw the use of what I call ad mules, which um, basically bad actors, in this case Russia, were paying Ukrainians in order to have access to their Facebook accounts so they could get around Facebook's geographical ad restrictions 
and uh, place ads during the Ukrainian election. And the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian security service uncovered this and, um, and you know, put, put up a news release about it. But unfortunately, the entire time I was in Ukraine, I would do searches for you know, account rental on Facebook. And there were very many active posts still looking for this sort of person who'd be willing for $100 a month, which is quite a lot of money in Ukraine, about a third of the average Ukrainian salary, um, to, uh, to spread uh, disinformation through those ads. And we're seeing similar things now happening in the United States. I just had a piece that came out yesterday in Wired about the danger of Facebook groups. Um, and again, domestic disinformation is a huge problem and something that I have learned throughout all of my research in, in many different countries is that when politicians are using disinformation for political gain, but on the other hand, they're decrying foreign interference in their elections and their political processes, you cannot fight either of them. Uh, you need to either recognize disinformation as a threat to democracy writ large, or you can't do much, much about it at all. And so what can educators do? Um, I know you were promised some tips and I am here to give them to you and we can get more into them in the Q&A, but I am a huge proponent of education and awareness building as a, an antidote to disinformation. It is not a panacea, but I truly believe that any uh, fulsome solution to this problem is going to be uh, with, with educators and through educating people. And I love this Thomas Jefferson quote for this reason. I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. Um, and I think that just goes to show that this has been a problem for a long time. Um, so here's, here's a few things that you can do. I have been encouraging everyone to practice informational distancing. Just like we're practicing social distancing right now, we need to recognize that we're being emotionally manipulated. So when you feel yourself getting mad about something you read on the internet, best thing to do is close your device, put your phone down, walk away for a little bit. And if you still feel yourself mad or if something's like nagging at you in the back of your head after a couple minutes, here's what you can do to try to just do a quick gut check on the source. It shouldn't take very long. First, if you're on a website um, that is claiming to be a news source, does that source have a masthead? Does it have contact information at a physical address or have a phone number that you can call? And does the author that the, the piece claims to be by have other pieces that they've written? Um, we've seen some elaborate uh, uses of fake persona by uh, bad actors like Russia, but generally a lot of people will just make up authors on fake news sites. Uh, so that's a quick gut check that you can do. But you can also check the text itself. You can copy and paste part of it into your web browser. See if anyone is reporting the same thing or more likely in a disinformation scenario, a lot of the texts are recycled over and over. So if it's coming up on several shady websites at once, ding, 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 that's a good indication that you shouldn't trust it. The other, and I think this is probably the most important thing you can teach yourselves or your students to do, reverse image search. We trust the images that we see. Um, and every time there is some sort of flood or hurricane here in Washington, there is a fake image that comes up of a shark swimming in the Potomac River. It's fake, but every time people buy into it. However, if you know how to do a reverse image search, which is a simple thing anybody can do, uh, you can find out the first time that image appeared online. If you're using a Chrome browser, you can just right click um, and it will reverse image on Google Images, but there are also some other open source tools you can use. I'll make sure you have those links um, to follow up with, but it's a very easy thing to do and everyone should learn how to do it because images uh, are, are manipulated all the time or even just misattributed. A lot of times with Ukraine, uh, Russia will attach pictures to articles it says are about Ukraine, but they're pictures from, you know, the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Um, and then finally, just important to practice social media skepticism. Understand that there are people who are trying to manipulate you on the internet, even if you're in a private group with them and a few other friends, uh, or, you know, hundreds of other friends in many cases, um, there are people who are, who are out there to manipulate you, either, you know, for these reasons that the nation states are doing, but some people are just trying to make money, and it's best to be wary. The same way we've developed um, an innate sense that 
We uh, shouldn't believe that email from the Nigerian prince or when we get a phone call that says our social security uh, information has been compromised. We need to develop that same sense for the internet. Um, and then finally, just basic cyber hygiene is really important for everyone right now to make sure your accounts aren't gonna be compromised by bad actors, to make sure your personal information isn't used either to fund disinformation or, or, or similar things like that. Uh, Two-factor authentication is something you should turn on for every account that has any personal information. This is so that if your password gets compromised, there is a second factor, either a text message sent to your phone or there are apps that do this, um, that basically if that password is stolen, people can't get into your account if you have two-factor turned on. It's hugely important. And then I encourage everyone to use a password manager so that you can create complex passwords and never have to remember them except for the one password to get into that account. Um, it's something that we should be encouraging everyone to do, just like brushing our teeth. Cyber hygiene is hugely important. My book is coming out on July 9th. Um, it is about uh, how different governments respond to information warfare. Uh, it mostly talks about Russia, but I think all of the lessons are very, very applicable to any dom domestic disinformation, whether that is about the protests over recent weeks or coronavirus or whatever else 2020 is going to throw at us. Um, I think it has some really practical tips and also just shows how these campaigns work um, and makes a plea for everyone to get more involved and make sure that we are holding ourselves and our politicians accountable for the truth. Um, and that is all for me. This is my contact information. I would be happy to be uh, in touch with any of you. And if um, when you return to school, if you're uh, covering any of these issues in your classes, I would really um, love to come talk to them as well. And we will do the Q&A and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, let's begin with our first question here, and they are all coming in. Um, what is an ad mule? Right, let me explain it again, because I went over that a little bit quickly. So basically, um, it is when a bad actor will rent out an account, a Facebook account or any other account where you can purchase ads, in order to get around ad restrictions. So that person might have had, the bad actor might have had their ad account turned off, um, and you're gonna go to crazy Uncle Joe and say, hey, Uncle Joe, I'm gonna give you a hundred bucks if you allow me to use your account to place ads. And what they're doing is very, um, very clever actually, rather than just like say, okay, give me your password and I'll log in from Russia, which would probably set off some alarm bells at Facebook. Um, they're using team viewer software. So if you've ever had a problem with your computer and you call tech support and they're like, okay, let me take control of your device. That's what they're doing. They're controlling the devices remotely, um, which doesn't set off the same alarm bells. And so this person, in effect, becomes a mule for the bad actor's ads. Um, they, are, they are placing them, it looks authentic, um, and if there are geographical ad restrictions turned on uh, for that country and that country's elections, then they are uh, less likely to set off those alarm bells. Great, thank you. That, was, that question was from Ron. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Gloria. Can you tell us about the current Ukrainian president's actions post-election? Oh, I could tell you for a long time. Let me try to give you uh, some of the, the highlights. Um, there are some things that Zelensky has done really well and some things that he's done really poorly, <laughs> which is probably true for any president. Um, I think people were really excited um, you know, at the, the progress that could be made. Um, he has made some uh, progress on things like land reform, which made it really difficult for uh, Ukrainians to buy and sell land because of certain restrictions. And that is seen as one of the key things that's necessary to kind of move Ukraine into the future and make sure its agricultural potential is, um, is kind of fulfilled. But um, there have been a few worrisome things as well. I unfortunately am very sad to say that uh, the openness that the Zelensky campaign had when I was covering it during the campaign period has, has kind of dissipated. Um, they have a very poor relationship with the press right now. Uh, and I wish they would be more open um, to the press uh, I think that's a key key part of, of any presidency, obviously. Um, and there are some worrisome anti-corruption actions that haven't happened uh, that, you know, people are, are it, I think it's too soon to say, but, um, but there are warning bells. 
On the other hand, um, there have been a few positive things with the war. He has secured two rounds of prisoner exchanges um, and gotten back uh, from Russia a, a famous director who had been a political prisoner for a long time. Um, so that was a positive thing. Uh, and also the sailors, if, if anyone remembers a couple of years ago, a bunch of sailors were taken prisoner by Russia. He was able to get them back. He handled, uh, although this seems like eons ago, the, uh, the downing of the Ukrainian airliner in Iran at the beginning of the year. He handled that very well for a political novice. Um, but there are worrisome signs in, in other ways. But I don't like to kind of say that I have a crystal ball. I prefer to ev analyze events after they've happened. And uh, I think, you know, mixed, mixed signals right now is, is the short answer. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for that answer, Nina. I just want to um, let everyone in the webinar space know we're getting so many good questions um, and we are kind of closing in on time. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do is answer questions until seven. Um, and then um, Esther and I still have some resources that we want to um, share with you. So if you could stick around um, for 10 minutes after the webinar, five minutes after the webinar, we would really appreciate it. But we're going to spend some time answering these questions. So this question is from Yves. Why um, is, why does the information is so efficient today in your so why is this information so efficient today in your opinion uh, I think it is the use of social media, basically. Um, so before, and I'm going to continue to pick on Russia because that's what we're talking about. Um, before, when, when Russia wanted to spread propaganda during the Soviet period, uh, it took a while for things to travel. Um, we also had a lot more gatekeepers in our media system. You know, we had TV, we had paper, we had the newspapers, uh, the newspapers and radio, rather. Um, and it was hard for that information to, to, to get in. Information moved a lot more slowly. Here, not only does information move much more quickly, but it can be targeted um, directly at the people who are going to be most vulnerable to it. And that's where things like Facebook groups and advertising come in. And it's really, really worrisome. I like to say that the tools of disinformation have been democratized. It's not only that Russia can do this. Anybody can do this. Anyone with a Facebook account and a couple of bucks can do it. It doesn't cost very much. And Russia's strategy is a lot more like spaghetti at the wall than it is something that's um, you know, very, very planned out. They, they just throw spaghetti, they see what sticks, and when they find out what sticks, they keep throwing that same strand of sp spaghetti at the same spot over and over. Um, and that's what everyone is doing right now. And the, the tools um, and the business model of disinformation and social media is what makes that possible. Great, thank you so much. Um, this, or this question is from Tony. Toby, I'm sorry. How are annuals being detected and traced? Oh, that's a good question. They're really hard to detect and, and trace. Um, so the, as I said, the, the issue in Ukraine was discovered by the security services there. Uh, so they have some, uh, you know, covert ways that they, they go about that. Um, and I think there are also open source ways to do this because, as I said, very easy for me to type in Russian and Ukrainian account rental just into the search box on Facebook and it comes up in a lot of groups. It comes up on pages. Uh, some of those pages seem to get shut down very quickly, but there are encrypted and secret ways that people are reaching out to one another in order to do that. Um, and so I think we need to uh, focus in a little bit more on that kind of overt detection. And um, unfortunately, it's perhaps Facebook is being a little bit more uh, astute about it in the English speaking world, but a lot of the, um, the developing world, which relies a lot more on Facebook than, than many other countries, than uh, the English speaking world, uh, Facebook is not, you know, directing as many resources there. This is not only true for Ukraine, it's true for Burma, it's true for uh, India, Brazil, a lot of places. Um, and I would like to see Facebook really uh, understanding why, what is driving people to do that and trying to stop um, those manipulations happening on the platform. But I don't think we're, we're making progress there, unfortunately. This question is from Jen Hunt. Given education is a way to inoculate the population, would you recommend assignments with school-aged children that encourage them to work with parents or grandparents on it? What other ways can we educate older voter voters who are statistically more likely to spread misinformation? Great question from Jen Hunt. This is a great question. Uh, this is my soapbox issue. So you're exactly right. Um, there is kind of a trickle-up effect, certainly. I think if, if kids are working with their parents and grandparents on, on these projects, that's 
a great way to reach them. I also remember there are a few librarians in, uh, in our chat. Um, I think libraries are a great vector for educating people. Um, if you look at the polling, libraries are one of the only like very well trusted institutions left in the United States still. Um, and so I think they're, they're, they're viewed as a trusted resource. Um, in many ways, they are, uh, you know, looking for their new raison d'etre in the 21st century, uh, in this digital age. And I think that is a way that people can, you know, be brought together and taught these skills by somebody that's still a trusted vector in the community. Um, I think social media platforms have a role to play. They have a ubiquitous, you know, entryway into every person's life, and we've not seen enough of an investment from them. But our elected officials also have work to do. Uh, they need to be not sharing this stuff. They need to be messaging that it is a threat to our democracy and not something that they're happy to use all the time also. Yes, thank you. Can you cite some, this question's from Eugenio. Can you cite some examples on how disinformation plays on the ethnicity divide or perhaps a language barrier? Who has the upper hand and what, Ukrainian, what do Ukrainians plan to do about it? Hmm. Okay, uh, there are a lot of examples of this in Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, I'll actually talk not about the Russian-Ukrainian uh, divide, but about um, the Hungarian minority in Ukraine which uh, there, there's a small Hungarian population because of the way that borders shifted after World War II. Um, they have a couple of, of enclaves in the West and um, Russian provocateurs have been attempting to uh, basically weaponize, although I hesitate to use that word um, in this context, the uh, historical divides between the two communities, essentially playing on old um, animosities from World War II in particular, um, and there have even been instances of violence where uh, we think Russia has funded either um, kind of Hungarian separatists, or this has also happened in, in Ukrainian-Polish relations, to burn things down and deface memorials and things like that. So that's one example. Um, but also Russia says that, you know, Ukraine is uh, persecuting Russian speakers. This isn't true. Uh, the new government, for what it's worth, I think is doing the right thing in terms of its outreach to Russian speakers. Poroshenko had a policy of really not engaging in Russian or with the Russian speakers very much. Um, and I think that is leaving people behind. But Zelensky being a Russian speaker himself, although he's switched, of course, to Ukrainian since he became president, uh, he's been doing a lot of outreach in those areas. He is going to I don't know where this stands right now because obviously coronavirus has, has ruined every, everything. Uh, but um, he, he has planned on starting a Russian-speaking TV channel sponsored by the Ukrainian government in the Russian-speaking areas. Um, so conducting that positive outreach is a, is a huge thing. Um, and, and hopefully uh, people will continue to try to repair those divides um, at, at the source rather than uh, just playing whack-a-troll to try to, um, you know, help the situation along. Yes, thank you. This uh, question is from Anna. Do you have any idea how Facebook has been faring in addressing disinformation being floated in their platform? Poorly. <laughs> um, not, not very well. So they've, they've made a lot of progress. There are some very, very smart people who have their heart at the right place working there. Um, the problem with Facebook is the business model. We are the product for Facebook. Uh, Facebook is making money off of us, not only through the ads, but by you know driving us to spend more and more time on the platform. Um, there are a number of areas that are, are really worrisome ahead of the 2020 election. Groups are one of them, and I encourage you to look at this piece uh, that I, I published in Wired just yesterday. It's called Facebook groups are destroying America, which is maybe a, a little bit more harsh than I would have gone for the headline, but that was not my choice. Um, and uh, yeah, so so basically, it, it, they're ignoring some of the key vectors, and in fact, I would say incentivizing uh, bad actors and and people to be spending more time in these kind of informational cesspools. Um, there has been some progress made. Facebook spending a lot of money to try to register voters and things like that. But without changing the business model and the fact that consumers, users are, are you know, what is making Facebook its money, um, we're going to be in the same place for a long time. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, how have Ukrainians reacted to the impeachment of Trump? Uh, I think they're tired of, of being the center of attention. They were happy to, to get away from it for a little while. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, now they're focused on, on coronavirus, certainly. But um, there have been 
a couple of attempts recently by uh, certain political operatives to bring Ukraine back into the spotlight. And Ukraine does not want to be in the spotlight. Ukraine relies on the United States for a lot of aid, uh, for international support. It doesn't want to risk that relationship um, to be a pawn in someone else's political game. And I think Ukrainians are absolutely tired of the attention that they've been getting from people who are not influential Ukrainian citizens, I might add. They are people who are in many ways disgraced and self-serving. Um, and so whenever you see any of anything coming out of Ukraine, uh, you should do a little research about who gave what to whom um, and see, <laughs> see if they are a trustworthy figure in Ukrainian society. Uh, if you can, consult a Ukrainian journalist and they'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your thoughtful responses. I want to take a moment now while we're switching in between screens to thank Nina so much for her time and her expertise and her and her answers to all these questions. Um, join me in the chat box um, and in thanking her. You can say thank you um, uh, digitally that way. Um, and I am going to transition to our PowerPoint here. Just give me one second. Oh, while Joy is doing that, I will I will vocally uh, thank you. It was very interesting. I uh, I know I appreciated and learned a lot, uh, especially kind of bringing up not just the Ukrainian Russian linguistic issue, but just how complex the linguistic kind of landscape is in Ukraine, um, but and and really that whole part of the world and touching on on the Hungarian speakers there as well is really interesting. So thank you for that. As a person who finds languages interesting, that was particular. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm so, glad you. you liked it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, if you are interested in Nina's reporting project with the Pulitzer Center, um, you could find. Um, the reporting project Ukraine's 2019 elections disinformation and divides on our website. Um, I've listed the link right here. Um, I highly recommend it. It's an engrossing, engrossing read. And I was telling her earlier, it, it's like reading a satirical novella. It's really engaging. So if you have time, you should definitely check that out. Um, before I um, hand it off to Esther, who is going to um, share information about an upcoming PD with all of you, um, I'd like to extend an invitation for collaboration. Um, the Pulitzer Center is based in DC, but I am based in Chicago. Um, um, and I am really excited and interested in engaging with all of you and um, expanding programming here. So if you are interested um, in hosting journalists in your classroom, engaging more deeply in reporting projects, email me, um, jmukherjee -E -E at closecenter.org. Um, there's the sneaky agent there, so be careful when you're typing that. Um, you can also subscribe to our newsletter. Um, I am actually um, really interested in collaborating with educators around specific topics in the upcoming year. Um, if you're interested um, or you're a passionate educator, um, that's passionate about um, climate change and conservation or um, the history of Black Americans and their legacy in the country. Um, I am going to be expanding programming connected to reporting projects that explore those topics. So if you're um, an educator that's interested in, in chatting with me about that or you know an educator that is interested um, in that and is, is passionate about bringing those kinds of issues into their classroom, please connect us. I would love to work with you. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Esther. Uh, thank you, Joya. Uh, and again, thank you both to uh, Nina and everyone for participating and for such wonderful questions. Um, so th this is just some ways that you can connect with our center. So you see our email there, series at uchicago.edu. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is, that's a great email to use to get in touch with me if you are an Illinois public school teacher and you would like, uh, 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 you know, a professional development credit for this, or if you could use a, a certificate of completion, please use that email address. You can find our website there, as you can see, series.uchicago.edu. We hope to be launching our new website later this summer, but right now everything's there. We hope it'll be a little bit fancier in a couple months, but the, the information will be the same. You can follow us. We have a Facebook group, you know, uh, after all this conversation, but we do have a, a Facebook group uh, where we post things uh, as well as you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, and I would like to uh, point you towards our YouTube channel uh, where we host a lot of videos, interviews with authors, other roundtables, uh, different types of events, performances, uh, things along those lines. That's a great way 
uh, to reach out to us. And then, uh, Joy, if you don't mind going to the last slide, I think um, I want to point out just uh, next week, we have another uh, professional development opportunity. Again, this will be uh, in conjunction with not just our center in Pulitzer, but also the Center for East Asian Studies and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. This is our uh, summer 2020 uh, summer institute for educators. We host this. Um, and I see a question here about the professional development credits. Just ask me. You can email me at series at uchicago.edu. Sorry. Um, uh, but also you can go to, we will be doing another kind of similar style event for those of you who have attended, if anybody's attended in the past when we've been able to do them in person. Uh, we will be trying to recreate that event as much as possible in the virtual space, focusing on COVID-19, of course, but also just public health in, in the kind of regions our centers cover. Uh, so, you know, in addition to how are our regions responding to coronavirus, how have they responded to past public health exercise uh, uh, incidents, HIV, SARS, things along those lines. And you can see that there's registration information available at educatoroutreach.chicago.edu. I would also encourage you, in addition to our website, you can find a host of resources and videos. I, I believe someone in the chat asked about this particular webinar. We will be posting it both to this site as well as we have a University of Chicago Educator Outreach YouTube channel. This video will be hosted there. Uh, so uh, once we get it up and ready, uh, we will be letting everybody know where to find that. But that's a great resource for past events that we've done, uh, as well as information on upcoming professional development events. So, um, and I can go ahead and put that email address uh, in the chat just so everybody has it. Oops, too many E's. That's not usually the problem with our center's acronym. So. Uh, please feel free to email us there. That comes directly to me. Uh, so, um, but that's just an easier way than trying to remember uh, my personal email address. So, just uh, in that in that way. So, thank you again for coming, um, uh, and I hope you will be able to attend next week's summer institute as well. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.